Savage. Who we're missing somebody else? Savas. Oh, Savas. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, let's get started. So we started talking about um, radiation impedance yesterday, and. Um, in, in all the sources in this course, when we, have, when we have a source, all the moving elements are going to be in phase with the same amplitude, okay, which is typically the case, although not always. But in that case, the general definition of the uh, radiation impedance becomes this. Here, here's, the, here's the general form. But when everything's in phase, the sources we're going to consider it just reduces to this, as we mentioned yesterday. So it's the force exerted by the moving surface on the fluid divided by the velocity of the surface. Um, and of course, these are complex. There can be a phase difference there. That's very important as, as we, well, we, are, we already started to see it because when they're in phase, when there's a, if you look at the real part, let me make this specific. When you look at the real part of the radiation impedance, that dictates the acoustic radiated power. Okay, that's called the radiation. It's so important we got names for these things. This is called the radiation resistance. The imaginary part is called the radiation reactance. So the radiation resistance is associated with the energy that you're dumping in there and it's not coming back. It's all being radiated. Okay? The reactance is this situation where you can dump energy into the local field and it can come back and go back and forth. There's no actually loss of energy there. You're not dumping, on the average, you're not dumping any energy into the fluid. It's sometimes coming in, sometimes coming back. That's the reactance. Both of these are important, as, as I'll explain. Yesterday we noticed that this is important because this is connected with the total acoustic radiated power. The average power that you're putting in is going to be, by energy conservation, will be equal to the average acoustic power. And we came up with this simple formula, very easy to remember, because of, it's the same as for a resistor. Um, <clears throat> the total radiated power is one half the square of the peak velocity of the surface times the radiation resistance. So the, the big important thing here is the fact that once you know the radiation resistance, which is sometimes can be very difficult to calculate, but you can often look it up. Somebody else has done all the work, okay? Once you know it, you can calculate the acoustic radiated power. This is almost always an important quantity. Now, I'm, I mentioned the imaginary part is important also. Okay, and the we can see why the imaginary part's important here. So let's look at, and we'll assume that the, uh, it's, posit it's the positive reactance here. <coughs> So look at the total imp impedance seen by the, the drive, the, the external source that's driving this, the external agent that's driving this source, okay? Sees an impedance, there's the mechanical impedance of the driver, which is just a typical model of damped harmonic oscillator, and then the radiation impedance. As we discussed yesterday, you see the sum of those two. So it's right out, with these, as we know what these are, we know what the, um, the mechanical radiation impedances, damped, simple harmonic oscillator. And then we write the radiation impedance as it's real plus I times it's imagined, you know, the, the resistive and the, re and the reactive parts. And then we lump the real parts together. Here they are, are over here, no big surprise there. But look what happens in the imaginary part. When I add this to this, and I factor out an omega. You notice I put, <coughs> multiplied and divide the reactive term, the radiation reactance by omega, so that I could factor out an omega here. This is a very important and it's a simple result once you see it, okay? This is telling us that what the, what the driver, what the external agent who's pumping energy in, let me, let me restate this. What this is telling us is the effective mass of the driver, the inertia of the driver, is not just the bare mass there. It's getting weighted down by the, uh, by the fluid. This comes from the fluid. So the reason that's important is, the main reason that it's important is, it changes the natural frequency of the, of the source. 
And often, for example, in sonar applications, you want to operate at the resonant frequency to get the biggest amplitude out. So the resonant frequency is going to go from the square root of the stiffness divided by the inertia, right? S over M in a vacuum. So when you go into a fluid, the resonant frequency is going to drop by this, uh, this quantity here. It's the radiation reactance divided by the angular frequency. And that's so important, it's called, it's got a name, it's called the radiation mass. So this is the main reason that that's important. So the radiation resistance is a big deal. And again, I want to remind you, one of the reasons it's a big deal is it's often hard to calculate. And so you, you know, it's been calculated before and you just look up the results and you can get a lot of use out of it. So the first thing we're going to do with, uh, regarding it is calculate it in a simple case, which is the pulsating sphere. <coughs> So here it is. There's the defini our definition, right? In our case, it's just the uh, total magnitude of the force exerted by the surface divided by the velocity. The force is just the pressure times the area. This is going to be 4 pi a squared. And we know what this is for a spherical wave. This is the wave impedance, or the specific acoustic impedance for a spherical wave. Remember, it's rho naught c times the cosine of the, this angle theta, the phase angle theta, times e to the i. Remember that? So um, we can look at the real and imaginary parts. Here are the real and imaginary parts. So for a pulsating sphere, this is the radiation impedance. And again, S here is the, the moving area, which is just going to be 4 pi a squared, where A is the radius. And theta we get from this right angle construction here, this phase angle theta. Now this is not a um, simple expression here. And because of that, and also to, to get a feel for this and to check the result, we're going to look in the two standard limiting cases. And we've already started to do this, and we're just going to keep doing it for the rest of the course. The two cases are, the two um, Standard cases are short, uh, long wavelengths. Ka, you remember, k is the wave number, 2 pi over the wavelength. So when ka is much less than 1, that means long wavelength. Large wavelength compared to the size of the source. And now, and we've been through this before, when this is very small, you can see that the cosine of theta becomes approximately equal to just ka. It's this divided by that. But when Ka is small, the hypotenuse is very close to 1. So this is our approximation for low Ka. The sine of theta approximately equal to 1. So you plug that into the radiation impedance. And here it is. We've got a real part. We've got an imaginary part. The first thing you want to notice here is that because Ka is small, what's this term going to be compared to that term, the magnitudes? This is going to be much less. When you have a small quantity, you know, and you square it, you get a really small quantity. So the radiation resistance here is dominated by the reactants. Okay, and this is, again, just another statement that a small source is a weak radiator. It's an inefficient radiator, right, that we've encountered before. Because the radiation is, the, is connected to the resistive part here. Um, why is the reactance dominating here? Well, KFCS has this explanation, right? There's this, when the wavelength is large, we have a small source here. This energy is being dumped into and out of this, cir this uh, circumferential compressing and expanding. Okay, so it's like a, this local field here is we're putting energy into it and, and it's coming back out. Energy is shuttling back and forth between the drive and the near field here. Um, and now we can calculate the radiation mass. This is interesting. So here it is. Remember, it's the radiation reactance divided by omega. And when we do that, we take our approximation here. This is the small source, you know, small source, large wavelengths. Plug the numbers in, and something interesting happens here. It doesn't always happen. I want to warn you, we will hit homework problems in this. But in this case, it does. At low frequency, omega is equal to CK, right? 
So we get this simplification here. What happened to the frequency? It's gone. So in the long wavelength limit here, the radiation mass becomes independent of frequency. In general, it can be a function of frequency. You know, in general, the radiation, the radiation reactance is not going to be proportional to omega, okay? but it is here. So we get this nice, simple result. And look how we can write it. We put in the 4 pi r squared, a squared. OK, we get this. And I'm going to multiply and divide by 3. And the reason is, this is the volume of our sphere. Right? So the way that people remember this result is, when you've got a spherical transducer, long wavelength, right? the radiation mass that you're going to feel here, if you drive this thing, it's not just going to be the inertia, the, the, the moving inertia, mechanical inertia, but there's this effect due to the fluid, this reactance due to the fluid. And that mass is, here's the mass per unit volume, it's three times the volume of the sphere. So I think a lot of underwater acousticians know this result. In air, not such a big deal. Air's, the density of air is like one thousandth the density of water. But in water, this can be a serious thing. So if you've got a transducer like this, the inertia that you feel is not just the mechanical inertia due to the moving, you know, moving mass here. There's a loading, an effective inertia due to the fluid. And it's three times, it's, it's the, the mass of the fluid that's three times the volume of the sphere. That's, what we've, that's how we state this result. Uh, the other limit is the high frequency limit. This is simple. Remember, all right, here's my sphere. I look, at, I look locally here, and I see approximately a plane wave, right? And the smaller the wavelength, the more it's going to look like a plane wave. So what happens in this case? Well, let's look at the math, and then we'll interpret it. Um, if you look at the right triangle diagram, now we have this case. The cosine is going to be approximately equal to 1 of the phase angle, and the sine is going to be approximately 0. So now, if you go up here, plug this into where it is, plug it into there. Here's what you find. The radiation impedance is purely resistive, and it's equal to rho naught Cs. OK? So why is it purely resistive? If I'm driving a plane wave, suppose I have this infinite rigid plane, I'm going like this, what's the radiation reactance there? It's purely resistive. You, the, you, the energy you're putting in, it's, it's gone. It propagates away. There's none of this interplay, this reactive. It's not reactive. It's, like, it's just like a string. Same thing with a string. You take the end and go like this. And furthermore, not only is it purely resistive, we know what the radiation resistance is. It's rho naught c. That's the wave impedance. Excuse me, that's the specific acoustic impedance, also known as the wave impedance. The radiation resistance, remember, refers to force rather than pressure. So we know that for a plane wave, the pressure over the velocity is equal to rho naught c. To get the force over the velocity, I multiply by s. So this is right. I multiply by the area. So it becomes very simple. And this is a good thing in both of these limits. The radiation impedance becomes simple, and that's a good thing to look at. You're, you know, you're checking. We're checking the result. We're believing it. And the other thing is that usually the radiation impedance is complicated, as we'll see. And if you're in one of these regimes, there's no reason to use the complicated expression unless you're doing something very, unless you're working for NIST, okay? The National Institute of Standards, okay? So uh, it's something to keep in mind. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. Any any questions so far? Uh, okay. So you know it's coming, and here it is. What's the radiation impedance of a baffled circular piston? We need to know that. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, we're not going to do it. I'm just going to, we're going to use the result. 
We'll talk a little bit about how it's gotten. But if you want to see how it's done, you, you look in the book, okay? It's not a simple calculation. So here's the idea. We'll just do the setup here. Um, here it is, the radiation impedance. It's going to be the force. The force is, of course, the force of the surface, you know, the piston face on the fluid, instantaneous force, is going to be whatever the pressure is integrated over the area. And that's going to be complicated. You know, it's not uniform. It's not uniform. So it's only going to be uniform in the high frequency limit. And I guess the low, it'll be simple and low frequency limit too. Those two cases we just looked at for the spherical source. So this is tough here. And what is, the, uh, what, is this, what is this pressure here? Well, if you look at the fluid phase, uh, excuse me, if you look at the, here's the, look at a little area here. Now, I've called this DS prime. You'll see why in a minute rather than DS. There is a force there. There's a pressure exerted by the surface. The pressure exerted by the surface on the fluid has to be the same as the pressure of the fluid on the surface. They have to be the same because there's a very, you can think of a very thin film of fluid there. Right, here's the surface. There, the pressure has to be continuous here. The, the pressure that's exerted, felt by the surface here on the fluid, has to be the pressure exerted by the fluid on the interface. Because there's no mass in that very thin film there. So pressure has to be continuous. So this pressure here, you can think of it as come arising from all the other elements here. They radiate and they give rise to a pressure field here in the fluid. So we take that pressure field in the fluid and evaluate it on the surface. That's what has to go into here. So you can see now that we really have to do a double integral here. Because to get the pressure here, we've got to integrate over all these other sources here. Once we got that, then we have to integrate over the whole surface. So there's a double integra integral here over ds and ds prime. However, reciprocity comes to the, to the uh, rescue here. <laughs> and it can be reduced to just a single integral. So you can see if you take this and put it, here's for these, each of these elemental sources, this is the baffled case that we've seen. You need to put that in there, you're gonna get this double integral. So anyway, you can use reciprocity to reduce the single integral to a, the double integral to a single integral. Okay, it's still a hard problem, okay? And you know, now that I think about it, I don't think, I think KFCS discussed the the use of reciprocity or to reduce it to a single integral. I don't think they do it. I think they just state the result. I haven't, I should have checked and I, I didn't check. Um, if, anybody wants to, if anybody wants to check right now um, and let us know, that's, that's fine. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure it's, it's a hard problem. It's a hard problem. The limiting cases are simple, as we'll see. But here's how the result is expressed, okay? So this is the radiation impedance for a baffled circular piston. Look at this right here. What's, does this look familiar? This is going to be, we know what's going to happen in the high frequency limit. You're going to have a plane wave coming off there, and the radiation resistance will be purely real, and it'll be given by this, like we just discussed, okay? So this has the right units, and it's going to be the high frequency limit. So the, the rest of this is dimensionless here. This R1, so-called R1 and X1, those are dimensionless functions. And it's convenient here to put a factor of two in the Ka. You'll see why on the next page. It's convenient to do that. And here are the results. Yeah, I'm almost sure the KFC couldn't do this. Is a, this is a hard integral to do. Here's the results. The, the dimensionless resistive part, we usually call it dimension. Uh, remember, this, we know this has the right dimensions because the radiation impedance has to reduce to this in the high frequency limit. So these are dimensionless, okay? So we usually call this the dimensionless radiation resistance and the dimensionless radiation reactance. So the dimensionless radiation resistance is given in terms of a Bessel function, J1 again, it's equal to this, of X. And for X, please note, we'll be doing homework problems on this. X here is not Ka, it's 2 Ka, 
happens to be 2K, right? KFCS tells you to do a homework problem. It shows the integral and it says you do a homework problem. And it gives you that answer. That's like a joke. I didn't know they had any humor in the book. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll have to check that. Um, the details are left to problem 7.5. Oh. Oh. So they must, they must, uh, okay. I'm going to check that. Yeah, I, I've forgotten. Um, yeah. So if you're interested and you want to see how this comes about, how you can beat it into the right form to get a Bessel function, the, the, real, the dimensionless real part involves a Bessel function. The dimensionless reactive part involves what's called a Struve function. This isn't, has nothing to do with, nothing directly to do with the um, directional factor, okay? This is just, this is one of those many functions, special functions of mathematical physics that we talked about yesterday. And you can look it up in Abramowitz and Stegen. In fact, I did do that before class. I wanted to make sure it was in there, and they have, it's, it's in there. Okay, so that's the standard reference for this. And like I said, somebody told me roughly five years ago that it's available online now. So it's a really useful source. It's a little tough when you first look at it because there's so much in there. But they lay things out in a... Um, in a, a pattern for each of all these special functions. And once you get used to that pattern, it's not so bad. Okay? But it has a huge amount of information. You can find probably everything you want to know about Struve functions by looking at that. We'll be doing some calculations with this, but we'll use tables in the back of KFCS to get approximate results, okay? So what does this look, what does this look like? Well, the, the dimensionless functions as a function of x, which is, remember, is 2ka, look like this. So here's the long wavelength limit down here. The short wavelength limit is here. And you can see that they have nice behavior in the long and short wave limit, as they really have to, because things get simple, as we, as we just saw for the spherical source. Here you'll notice that the radiation, the dimensionless radiation resistance is, this is not drawn well, it's, it's a parabola down here. It's coming in with zero slope. So it's going to be proportional to x squared. Th this, okay? For small x, it's going to be proportional to x squared. And this, again, you know, this is an old book, and they, these were, most of these figures here, I think, were hand-drawn, and they probably used French curve. You guys ever heard of French curve? <laughs> but this is a, this is a mistake. This, this, is a, this is parabolic. It's proportional to x squared when you get down here at low x. What's the proportionality constant? You can look it up. Okay, you can get it from uh, the small x behavior of J1. We'll do this in a homework problem. Uh, the dimensionless reactance, on the other hand, it's coming in, it's gonna be proportional to x. Okay, What's, what is the constant of proportionality? Well, you can look this up. And that information is gonna be in the back of, yeah, the, the low x behavior of H1 will be must, I think it's going to be in an appendix. And we'll deal with it in a homework problem. So let's look at the limiting cases here. We're not going to look at the, um, this is qualitative here, you know, like I said, this has to be proportional to x squared, this has to be proportional to x. We're not going to, um, I'm just going to give you the results. We're not, I'm not going to state, I didn't state here what specifically these limits are with the constant of proportionality. We'll do that in homework problems. The low frequency behavior here is, you know it's gonna go like Ka squared, right? R, the radiation resistance, because this is a par parabolic here. It looks like this. The reactance is proportional to um, Ka. So again, we see this for low Ka, we see a small radiation resistance. That's just the small source effect. Small source is a poor radiator. We've seen that many times. We're seeing it again here, as we must. We have to see it here. It has to be true. Because it's a small source, so it's not going to be a good radiator. Um, now, one thing we can do here is, if you look back at the notes from previous lecture yesterday, we found the radiation resistance for a small source. We backed it out, right? If you look at that, you'll find that it's identical to this. You have to, I think we have to put in terms of Q, we probably have to put it in terms of the source string. But if you do that, you'll find 
that this is identical to what we found yesterday for the radiation resistance of a small source. Um, the radiation reactants, how do we appreciate that? We go to the radiation mass. That's a nice physical way of looking at it. So instead of dealing with that, we're going to deal with that because that's the radiation mass. And now, when you, uh, there's a big surprise coming up here. When you plug the result in, this result, the low X or low Ka behavior of the radiation reactants, we get this. And we simplify it and we get that. Now, the way we interpret this is, this is a mass, right? This is the density, equilibrium density, mass per unit volume. This has got to be a volume. S is the area of the piston. So, the natural way to interpret this is, the radiation mass is a cylinder of mass. Here's our piston. And we can think of it as a cylinder of mass whose, um, you know, the end cap is going to be just this S here, pi A squared. This is going to be the height of the cylinder, right? Okay, with me? This is very simple. And this 8, this is exact in the limit of low frequency. This 8a over 3 pi is approximately 0.85 times the radius, okay? So what we're seeing here is, and maybe I should draw this. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'll explain this in a minute. But here's our, here's our piston. Forget this for right now. Here's our piston here. Right, here's the axis of symmetry. The radius of the piston is going to be this. This distance right here is A. And here, I'm, I should draw it a little bit bigger, shouldn't I? This is... The, ma the mass loading is given by the mass of the fluid in that cylinder right there. We're sending out this wave here. We're in the long wavelength limit. Okay. And this is the, you know, the 0.85A approximately. So what, is, what this means is, when we have a, a piston here, what you feel is not, when you're the external agent that's driving, putting energy in and driving this, is not just feeling the mass of the piston. You're, there's this fluid loading of the fluid here due to the reactants, and it's given by the mass of the fluid in that cylinder right there. And the reason this is important is when people think of a wave coming down a pipe, they, as far as I know, okay, there's one exception. That it's very complicated. We're, uh, Steve Emerson and I are, are, he doesn't know it, but we're going to be looking into it soon as part of his thesis research. The standard approximation is that the fluid right here is a piston. So when people want to know what happens when a wave is coming down a pipe and it's running, does this sound familiar? Remember World War II? Radar? Yeah, this was a big problem. It's an analogous problem for radar. So when you, um, want to know what's happening here where the waves coming down and radiating out. You imagine in acoustic that the fluid here is acting like a piston. That's the problem we're looking at right now. And we have found the end correction. We weren't looking for it. We were just thinking of a piston, right? But because of this, there's a connection between a piston and the waves coming down the pipe because of there's the modeling this, that everything's going like that, which I don't think is always true, incidentally. And it may not be true for a necklace Helmholtz resonator. And that's why we're interested, Steve and I are interested in this, because one of the projects in his thesis, which is on lecture demonstrations, is the necklace Helmholtz resonator. Oh, and incidentally, he said he found a ton of stuff on the internet about the car resonance. It was all non-technical. Did I tell you guys about this? I told you. No, I didn't tell you right. We talked about the car, the Helmholtz, the annoying resonance. There's stuff on the internet, but it's all non-technical. It's people who don't really know what's going on, so. I'm almost certain it's a Helmholtz resonance. It's such a low frequency, it really has to be a Helmholtz resonance. Um, so anyway, we, without trying to do it, we just found the famous Rayleigh end correction. Oh, I need one more thing here. It's a baffled piston, okay? Oops, it's a baffled piston, so we want to put that in. So here we were, you know, working on the piston here, but now we recognize 
with the wave coming down here, the natural model for a plane wave, not a waveguide mode, it's a plane wave, is to assume that this is acting like, the fluid's acting like a piston. Now that's the problem we just, we're doing, we're working on. And so that's how we were able to come up with the, the famous Rayleigh end correction. And when the baffle's not there, it's a much harder problem. And that's what took World War II for that to be solved. Uh, independently by a Russian and an American, interestingly enough. We talked about that. Uh, okay. Amazing. We'll encounter the incorrection later on in this course when we look at resonance. For example, resonance in a pipe like this, you know, you're going to get strong reflections here. There's a tip, uh, uh, typically, there's a big Unless the frequency is very small, you're going to have a big impedance mismatch here, as we will see. You're going to get strong reflections. You can get standing waves in here. Okay? And um, what's the, looking ahead a little bit, we want to be able to know what the resonant frequency is. Do you think it's going to involve just the length of the resonator? No, you've got to put the end correction on there. So we'll encounter that later on. Um, oh, the other limit, easy, high frequency limit. I'm going to put, I, I've decided I need to put this in the notes. So this is going to, in the revised notes, this, that, this is going to be in there. Uh, high frequency, uh, if you look at our expressions, they reduce to what, what they must, absolutely must reduce, reduce, reduce to. High frequency limit, there's no reactants. You're just sending, it's like driving a string. It's all resistive, it just radiates away. This is zero, and furthermore, this is equal to this. The same, for the same reason before, it's the wave impedance times the area. That's gonna be the radiation impedance, the force divided by the velocity. Um, So we have an express, oh, so we can now, I'm doing this for a reason. The total power radiator, remember, is given by this, right? We talked, we, we did this yesterday, I reminded you, we reviewed it a little bit at uh, the beginning of this lecture. Um, I plug in this result for the high frequency limit. This is where you're getting a nice beam that's coming out here, right? The high frequency limit, it'll slowly diffract. Um, we get this expression. All right, um, we know this, we already talked about this, but one of the interesting things here is that in the, this is a very simple limit, and we don't, we can get this result without having to deal with impedance at all. It's very simple, and I want to point that out. I don't think this is in the book. Yeah, I think it's not in the book because, <laughs> because there's a simple result that we established weeks ago that's not in the book, and I'll remind you of when we hit it. So what's the power here? In the high frequency limit, I have this piston phase. I have this little tiny wavelength. I'm sending out this beam, slowly diffracting, right? Right on the, the piston phase, it's just, this diffraction is a small effect here, okay? And you have to go some distance to start to see it because we're in the small, small wavelength limit here. So to find the power, we just take the intensity times the area. And the intensity is gonna be the same here. Once you get to longer wavelength, it's complicated what's going on. And that's how you get, end up with those, the Bessel function and the Struve function. But here, it's just going to be uniform. It's just the intensity times the area. The in, you remember this result we established? The intensity is the, and it's the time average intensity, of course. It's just the time average instant energy density times the speed at which that energy is moving. You remember that result that I told you is not in the book? Well, we used that here. The time average energy density is this right here. Okay. Now, you know, it's one half rho u, the kinetic energy instantaneous, one half rho u squared, then there's the potential energy density. But remember, this is the peak. You might say, well, why is the two there? Because you got kinetic and potential. Well, it's because this is the peak value. If you go to the RMS value, it's equal to that. Equal kinetic and potential energy. So if you look at this and you look at that, they're the same. So in this particular limiting case of high frequency, of small wavelength, we can verify our result 
very simply. We don't have to use impedance at all. Right? This doesn't involve impedance at all. It's very uh, basic here. Now, if you're dealing with Ka much less than 1 or Ka much greater than 1, um, then you can use the approximate expressions. It's very simple, right? If your Ka is roughly on the order of unity, you're out of luck, and you're going to have to use the, um, the exact expression, and we'll do a problem in that. One problem. I think it's just <laughs> that's all we want to do is one problem, and we'll be looking up the, these functions in um, the table from back of KFCS. Now, a, an interesting question here is, how big does Ka have to be for us to make the approximation? That's tricky, okay? It depends on how accurate you want to be. But what, KFC, what I've gathered from KFCS over the years is they typically push on, acousticians push on, push on that. It's so much simpler to deal with one of these limiting cases rather than the exact I think that's one of the reasons that they'll push on. I th another reason is I think you can actually get away with it. I think, and I don't understand this, but I know I've seen this a number of times, is we'll make this approximation of Ka much greater than one, where Ka could be, you know, like five or something like that. So it's an interesting question, you know. And if you need to ever address it, if you're ever doing some research on this and you want to know, you, you know how to do it, you can look at the exact answer and compare it to the approximate answer. You know, you can get the exact, we have the exact result there. You can get it out. And I've never looked at, um, you know, you can do some algebraic, you don't have to plug numbers in. What, what I would do is this, I'd go back to this, for let's say high Ka, right, which is high x. I would not go to x equals infinity here. You can see how these are going. R is going to 1, x is going to 0. I look at asymptotic expansions here and then compare that to the high Ka limit. And now that I think about it, I guess you can look, I guess there's some information that's given by this graph, isn't there? You see how the, the oscillations here are already dying. When you get to an 10, when you get to about 10, it's not too bad, right, on this scale. You've got maybe 5 to 10% error, I guess roughly 10% error here when you're out here. Um, when you compare the fluctuations here. And if it's natural to compare this to 1 on this scale. And so you can see here you've got a 10, 15% effect. It's not too bad, right? Not too bad. But again, it depends on what you're demanding, how accurate you want to know. So there's no universal answer to this question. It depends on what, what kind of precision you want. Um, OK. Um, so we'll do one homework problem. I remember, <laughs> I, I remember this from years ago. It's good to do one problem in this, but just one, okay. where Ka is roughly on the order of unity. So there we have to use the exact results. We'll use tabulated results in the textbooks. OK, anybody have any uh, questions? OK. So now we're going to do, part of this is review, and part of it is generalization. Um, on sources in general, okay? What we've seen here in the pulsating sphere and the piston, there's some general properties here of, of, of sources. So that's what we're going to spend the rest of the lecture on here. Um, as far as I know, for everything in this class, you will always be able to achieve this factorization where you can express the far field pressure amplitude as a function of r times an angular function. And when we're being general here, we don't have an axis of symmetry. So when we have an axis of symmetry, the far field is going to depend on you know, this angle here. If this is the axis of symmetry, we have this angle theta. 
and it's going to not depend upon phi. But when we don't have an axis of symmetry, in general, the other spherical angular coordinate will become involved, right? It's obvious. It's, it's, not, it's not obvious that you can always do this, that you can always factor this. I mean, you can play around with functions. I invite you to do this. I think I did it once. You can play around. There's, it's easy to come up with functions that you cannot factor like this. Think about it, okay? If you have trouble, contact me. But it, um, it always appears to work. It works in, our, in this course, and I don't know how general it is, but I suspect it's fairly, pretty general. And not only do we, do we factorize it like this, okay? We have a specific meaning behind the R, the R value. This is, this is the ax axial pressure. This is the, the actual pressure amplitude on what's called the acoustic axis, okay? For a line, oh, and I forgot. The, another source we've dealt with is the, uh, it's not just, I got trapped into this pulsating sphere and piston. We also did the line source, right? So here, Where's the pressure, where do we get in the far field, where do we get complete constructive interference? It's on this perpendicular bisecting plane, right? So in this case, the acoustic axis is a plane. So when people talk about the acoustic axis, it's a generalized, it's not necessarily a line, okay? That word acoustic in front of axis is a big deal. So it's where you have the maximum pressure amplitude, where you have complete constructive interference in the far field. So for a line source, it's going to be a plane. For a piston source, it is actually an axis, right? It's the axis of symmetry. I've got this piston source. I'm up here far away. I get my maximum, in, everything's in phase. I get the maximum pressure. It's a, the acoustic axis is an actual one-dimensional, it's a you know, one-dimensional line or a line which is one-dimensional. Um, so because of that, that's going to correspond to theta is equal to uh, zero by convention. Because that's the maximum, this H is going to have to be one on the acoustic axis. Whatever that axis may be, it's going to have to be one. Right? Uh, for monopole sources, our whole theory, uh, let me remind you, our whole theory here is for monopole sources. We know that the pressure has to behave like this. For a dipole source, you will have, pressure will be radiated, you know, we've done some ex demonstrations of that. This, you know, if I have a dipole source here, there will be radiation, but it won't behave like this. You know it's going to have an, it'll have an angular dependence, <coughs> cosine theta type dependence. But for monopole sources, which, we're, which is what we're interested in this course, <coughs> we've seen that in the far field, the axial pressure, the pressure falls off as one over R, no matter where you are. Okay, this is actually, this is how it behaves as a function of R. Um, <coughs> when you have axial symmetry, H, we, as I mentioned before, phi is not involved. And I put this in here for a reason. Let me, it's best to postpone this for a moment. Um, oh, wow. Hold on. So we already talked about this. Where you have the maximum directional factor, which is going to be equal to one here, I should have, should have written that in, that defines the acoustic axis. So again, for a line source, the acoustic axis is actually a plane. It's not necessarily a line, right? You want to keep that in mind. The beam pattern, now we didn't define it this way. We just said it's natural to take, we, we defined it like this, but a, a deeper definition is to define it as, in terms of intensity, as the intensity going in some direction at some fixed distance divided by the intensity on the acoustic axis, the maximum intensity. So, um, you know, this is not very physical, is it? it it's graphical. We, we, we define it as sort of a graphical thing. Okay, we want to look at dB rather than the linear to get the details of the, the low values of the radiation pattern, we want to take the logarithm. So we looked at it from a sort of a graphical point of view. 
But you can think about it more physically here. As the ratio, this intensity is going to, when you're off the axis, it's going to be down. So these are all, these are going to be negative values. You, the most this can be is one. So the beam pattern will be zero dB on the acoustic axis. And then it'll be so many dB down when you fall off. This ratio of the um, intensities, we can go to pressure here, right? And we get a two, as we've seen before. And now this is identical to H. If you look at this, you see the ratio of the pressures here is identical to H. So this is a more physical, um, this is, a, this is a, a physical definition of the beam pattern. Okay. Um, okay. So beam width is kind of a big deal, and people are almost always are referring to the the major lobe. So here's an example: a circular piston, right here. Here's the circular piston. I didn't draw it. Here's the axis of symmetry. So there's the major lobe. You want to be able to quantify the angular width of that beam. Okay, so first thing we do is, we don't measure it from here over to here. We usually measure the full, the full. By full, I mean we're doubling the, um, this, this value, this angle right here, okay? The next thing is we need to have some criterion, some convention for how far do you go down, right? There's no fixed convention, unfortunately. You can go down 3 dB, okay? And so I'm just going to, we're going to do a homework problem on this, but I'll just, I'm giving you the results here for um, Ka, for a Ka number of 8 pi. So the wavelength is a um, quarter of the radius. And um, the results are that when you go, if you want to specify the beam width, the full beam width here, as being 3 dB down, the angle is 7.4 degrees for a piston, right? For a baffled piston. <coughs> if it's 6 dB, it's 10 degrees. If it's 10 dB down, it's 12.9 degrees, 13 degrees. Finally, the most that anyone ever goes is to zero pressure. And you know, there's, a, there's a nodal cone here, right, in the far field. What angle is that at? Well, we know how to calculate that. That's 71 degrees. So you see there's a huge difference here order of factor of 10 difference. So you always want to specify what the, um, what the criterion is for the beam width. So, you know, manufacturers, they're going to want to quote the smallest value possible, right? Because you usually want a nice tight beam, especially if you're trying to locate and see things. So, you know, they're probably going to go to this, right? But it should be specified. What about amplitude? How do we deal with amplitude? We've talked a little bit about this before. The, the pressure is falling, I'm sorry. Let's talk about distance now. Here's the, the radiation pattern as a function of angle. How do we quantify how the, the sound field is falling off with distance? And again, we've talked a little bit about this before. For monopole sources, it's gonna fall off as one over R. So where do you, how far do you go out? Well, that's a problem. Right, to, to quantify this, how, how far you go out. So here's the, con I'm gonna repeat this. We talked about this earlier, you, you'll probably remember. What they do is, this is in the far field. You take measurements on your source, or you calculate it, or you do both, and then you extrapolate this value. You assume this is true all the way down to the source, and you go one meter from the source. Remember this? I told you guys about this once before. So, so that's the convention here. Um, now you want to be aware, as I mentioned to you before, that one meter from the source, the pressure field can be very different. And we now have, we didn't have this before, but we now have an excellent example. We know that the, a piston on axis here can actually have zeros. The pressure amplitude can be zero, zero on the axis, right? We, we calculate. We calculate the exact axial pressure. So the warning, this is kind of dramatic here. It could be that your piston source here we're dealing with the pit for a piston source. One meter from the source could have, z have zero pressure amplitude, all right? But the way they quantify the pressure is to extrapolate this down to one meter. You just got to recognize that it may not have, it really doesn't have anything to do with what's going on at one meter. 
It's the far field value extrapolated back, just because they've got to come up with some kind of distance here. So that's how they do it. Um, notice I, I'm saying they. It's not my fault. It's their fault. <laughs> but I don't know. Actually, I don't know what else you can do here. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's alternatives, but this is what people have settled on. So the, this is called the source level. It's measured in dB. Just, we measure this in dB too, right? So many dB down. Here, it's, uh, you just find the, um, you find the sound pressure level, which we know how to do, at one meter, where the one meter is the, this extrapolated back from the far field. And let me point out something here. This is one, you want to be careful with this. These are pressure amplitudes, right? Peak amplitudes. So when you're finding the sound pressure level here, which is, the, the source level is simply the sound pressure level at one meter, extrapolated back, right? Extrapolated back to one meter. Because this is the peak value, you've got to add the square root of two. Remember this 20, for example, the 20 micropascals, in all the dB measures here, the reference is an RMS, is an RMS value. For us, this is a peak value. So you have to divide by the square. You've got to turn this into an RMS value. So you have to divide by the square root of two. Well, there's more to do on this that we'll do um, uh, Monday, I guess. Tomorrow's a problem session. I haven't checked, but it must be. And we're due for a quiz break. I keep waiting for a quiz break. It's going to happen. We don't have a quiz every week, right? And that, it turns out that I know empirically that, that you don't want to have a quiz a week. It's, it, I sometimes do it, and it's, it's not good for students or the professor. But it's coming up. I don't know if it's going to come up. I don't know when it's going to come up. But anyway, we'll carry on. You've all probably heard of directivity. This has a precise meaning in acoustics, very important, especially for the Navy. We'll start with that on Monday. Thank you.